combination of stuff. You know, some people are bringing like control variants of it. Some people are bringing more like tempo variants of it. And I think that's just show, going to show you that we still have yet to explore like a little bit more of this meta game about like how we can take certain archetypes and even fuse them with the other ones that we've already seen in the past. Fusion. Yes. I just want to see Control Shaman Dan. I don't care about any of these decks. Uh we we did get to see some Control Shaman recently, TJ, but not none in Americas. It doesn't seem like anybody has uh faith in the elements in the way some other players have. Last weekend, for example, uh, in Masters of Montreal, we saw lots of Shaman. It was really fun. Well, there's also been, I think, two players recently that have won preserved. Masters Tour qualifiers with Control Shaman decks. Yeah, that's right. Control Shaman um, does have its place. I mean, Monsanto, America's GM, went pretty far with playing a Shaman anti-warrior lineup. That was more for an open field. It's a little bit trickier when you're playing like a match against two people of the week sometimes. And you have to prepare for a specific best of five. But yeah. uh, we are here in game number one. Zelay does have that overgrowth ready to go. And that guardian animals, but he's drawn two beasts. Which is a little bit awkward. He wants to avoid drawing any more beasts if possible. Yeah, taking a look at the list. Um, both players playing five beasts. Just a little bit of a different spread, whereas the lay has double Twilight Runner, double Teacher's Pit, and one Thresher. Whereas ETC has double Thresher, double Runner, and Teacher's Pet. Other than that, their, their decks actually have a couple of uh, uh, differences. Uh, notably, Zelay is playing Anubasoth Defenders. Um, and one broomstick, whereas ETC is going with the double crystal power. Uh, so a little bit more healing and a little bit more juice for those exotic mount sellers. Uh, but not quite the same punch from the survival of the fittest or guardian animals. Not too much of a difference in like play style. Honestly, I prefer the uh, crystal power version more if I'm playing one survival of the fittest. I feel like the Anubis Hot Defenders and uh, kind of shore up the, some of the weaknesses of playing double survival of the fittest because you can at least play a 7-9 on the turn on a turn if you have to play survival with a full 10 mana. But we'll see if it pays off for him. Yeah, this is definitely like an awkward guardian animal setup because a lot of times you're always thinking about how to use that rush and now you're like setting up something for your opponent to attack into and then also trade off so you don't even get that what? Uh, guardian animals guarantee. I still think it's worth doing because the you, you still don't even have necessarily those minions get um, drawn naturally and you know with guardian animals and two of your beasts already drawn it makes them a lot worse. But I guess what Zelay can also do is just kind of wait for ETC to play stuff and then just play Guardian Animals right then. So this is fine. Uh, what's not <laughs> fine is ETC drawing another five cost beast. Hmm. <laughs> ETC plays Twilight Runner here. Passes the turn, yeah. doesn't attack. Yes. Zelay plays a Twilight Runner here, passes the turn, doesn't attack. What if he plays? And they're both just drawing Twilight their beasts. Runner they're both just going to keep doing that over and over again, and then draw all their beasts before they ever even attack <laughs> or play Guardian what if Animals. He germinates. What if he germinations his Twilight Runner, TJ? Germinate Twilight Runner and play the Twilight Runner. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate stalemate. Yes, it is very. It's very humorous. Even Zelay's Zale like, Zale hmm. thinking through it right now, too. He's like, huh. I could make this game weird. Uh, it's already starting to get weird. We could definitely push it into very awkward territory. He's doing it. Twilight Runner right back. 
Germination. And germinate. And no attack. And not attack. Oh yes. Oh my gosh. Mm. So he doesn't even have hand space to, to attack with all his Twilight Runners. He has to play cards first. You know what actually could happen from ETC side? He doesn't know this, but Zelay could have ramp and then survive the fittest, and he takes takes like almost thirty next turn. Oh my god, <laughs> that would be absurd. It's fifteen plus twelve, so it's close. It's not quite there, but it's like almost like a one turn setup kill. <laughs> oh, jeez. Time waits for no one. Kind of thinking about if it's worth using an iron bar here at all. Looks like ATC does end up going for it. Oh, yeah? All right. Stopping sure. Zelay from getting any kind of uh, survival of the fittest momentum on his side. Is that a beast? Okay. Nope. I saw five costs and I'm like, oh my gosh. He's the only these are the last two beasts in his deck right here. He's tech features pet and leg pressure. So he can draw six cards. Alright. So he can play Bog Beam on one of these Twilight Runners. Attack Love with it. Lake Thresher. Yeah. And then attack with the other two uh Twilight Runners and then end with a Nubasat Defender. And he has nine cards in hand and pushed. 10 damage. First 10 damage. And he's a big board. He's ahead. Yep. Time waits for no one. I like it. Even using the iron bar so they can keep his uh, pressure reasonably healthy. Th this game escalated pretty quickly. It was a lot of uh, tension in the air. Yeah. I like the germination Twilight Runner pass setup from Soleil. He just had the more the more powerful board. And now ETC's hand, because he held on to Guardian Animals for so long, it's just... Nature speaks Expensive. Let's get to play Speaker Gitter here with the Guarding Animals. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I mean, that's big. And he can clear off this entire board. Kills off this if they... If the Silverback Patriarch comes out here. Oh! oh that's so... Per that's perfect! <laughs> wow. That is the juice. Oh my goodness. That went from like, yeah, you're losing this game almost 100% of the time to, wow, you have an 8-4 with Wind Fury. Yeah. There's not a broomstick here for Zelay. Uh, Rusher sure runs one broomstick. Rusher one of the differences possible. in the decks. Ooh. Oh my gosh, that swipe is nutty. Oh, swipe. Oh, it's so good. It's playable because of the nature studies discount. Yeah. He's not getting good beasts. Got a good spell. That's a oh. pretty good beast. And I actually would be thinking about taunting up. Not the Mount Seller. Chooses the Scarab. Okay. Does ETC have any more beasts in the deck? No. There are no beasts left, period. Both players have a teacher's pet in hand, and that's it. No beasts left in the deck for, for either player. Um, he has access to 13 mana this turn because of the 
Lightning Bloom and the Innervate, which is just a little bit short of any kind of nice breakpoint. What if he goes uh, like Teacher's Pet, Lightning Bloom, Overflow? Doesn't really solve a lot of his problems. Well, it sets him up to solve the problems next turn with the exotic mount seller. Because if you look at his deck, he has double broomstick, double nature studies, double crystal power, fog beam, lightning bloom. His deck is just chock full of uh, of cheap spells. Whoa! And this, th I mean, he's got two broomsticks, a mount seller, and a Sarah unleashed in his deck. Like, I, I feel like this is just yeah. spending 10 mana to do almost nothing. I, he's just dead. Yeah. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I thought about that play, the survival of the fittest, but like, it just had too little impact. And if Zelay has his, you die, so. Yeah. Zelay. <laughs> is Zelay kind of wondering what happened that game? Because I think we are too. Yeah, it, it just what that play was not setting up for anything. It, it set up for nothing. Uh, survival of the fittest. It was spend 10 mana to take 3 power off the board. Which you could have done Four, by like... But play. yeah. Because he killed the the 1-1. One, one. But yeah. It, he would have killed, really, killed that anyway. He would have killed the 1-1 one, one anyway because he would have attacked in with the uh, the Thresher. Okay, yeah, um, you're right, you're right. Um, so really didn't do much and it wasn't setting up for anything because what does survival of the fittest cap... What, is, what do you use survival of the fittest to capitalize on next turn? You have Sarah unleashed can't play it and draw cards in the same turn like you, mm -hmm. you i felt like he needed to like draw as many cards as possible there and then set up for a big swing turn where he goes exotic mount seller bunch of cheap spells broomstick take back the board and then use survival the fittest to, to close out the game from that point um but just didn't couldn't quite get there hard to win from that spot maybe uh regardless but i, th I felt like that was the play that won in the game the least amount of time yeah. All right. Well, that's just our first game in this best of five. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes and when we come back, the conclusion of today's broadcast is it is the final match in the final series. So we'll be back in just a few. Hang tight. Masters Tour Montreal Online is brought to you by T-Mobile. Switch today and rank up to America's largest 5G network. T-Mobile. Um, I would rather be the funniest person in the room at this very moment. Long term it would be better to be the smartest, but it's just about the moment. <laughs> funniest person in the room. Funniest? I would rather be the most funniest person in the room. I'd probably rather be the, the most intelligent person. Actually, if you're the most intelligent person in the room, you're in the wrong room, that's what they say. If you're the most intelligent person in the room, then you're probably also gonna be very sad. But if you're the funniest person in the room, then you're gonna make everybody laugh and everybody's gonna have a great time. So I'd rather have that. Yeah, I'd still rather be the most intelligent and the most funny person in the room. Uh, I think other people are more fun funny than me and I would rather be just the smartest guy there and. If we play a game, I, I would try to just outplay them. Intelligence is very nice, but happiness is more important. And I think also actually with happiness or with a lot of intelligence comes together as well. I think I am both, so... <laughs> That's a nice answer. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone, to Hearthstone Grand Masters. We are in the middle of a series between Zelay and ETC, and we're going to uh, take no more breaks as we finish out the rest of this series. And uh, right now, currently, Zelay is up 1-0 to zero after winning that Druid Mirror, which was a little bit unusual, but sometimes the unusual plays end up being some of the coolest plays in Hearthstone. We'll see Zelay turn to his Demon Hunter for Juniper 2 here. Yep. Demon Hunter, pretty standard, uh, the soul Demon Hunter, uh, Consume Magic being the only real tech card that he has at his disposal. Everything else is what we've come to expect. There is one card, though, that I'd like to point out that's in the key cards there on your screen, Altruist the Outcast. That is becoming a, uh, increasingly popular. Um, I wouldn't call it straight up popular because, you know, I'm pretty sure Zelay is one of the... Zelay and ETC are two of the only players that actually have it in their lists. Uh, every other Soul Demon Hunter we've seen is not playing it. Um, but it is picking up steam. And, I mean, the deck plays a lot of uh, cheap stuff. It's a, a deck that, you know, sometimes you just wish you had that one little extra AoE or that one little extra piece of burst damage. It allows you to use twin slices earlier on in the game and feel more comfortable about it before you go for those big uh, game-ending damage pushes. <clears throat> So, I'm actually just surprised it took this long for the, for the card to be in there. Um, just because it does, see, does seem like, especially with wand makers, that it fits quite nicely uh, in with the list. It's becoming a little bit lower curve and more consistent. That's where Altruist, I feel like, fits in well. Right, right. Soon enough, uh, you know, with Metamorphosis and Altruist, Maybe we just uh, cut some of the soul fragments and we start playing Battle Fiends, TJ. What do you think? <laughs> cut some soul fragments, start playing Battle Fiends, you know, sociologist. That's a little slow. Uh, yeah. Cut that and, you know, throw a Bone Chewer Brawler in there. Right. Um, Guardian Arc Merchant, maybe. Yeah. And then if you're cutting those, you cut the Shard Shatter Mystics and then, boom, there's your add a couple more weapons. That's right. Maybe uh, throw in the war glaives in there just so that we get a little bit more tempo. And exactly. I think that will be a really good deck to bring GM. Maybe uh, for an entire season, if you will. <laughs> I agree. Uh, if people don't understand, of course, uh, we're just joking around about the old Demon Hunter lists that played a very streamlined, aggressive game plan that featured some of the cards that we we're talking about and has since transitioned away from it after being nerfed wave after wave. What was it? Six waves of nerfs that finally put uh, all of the Demon Hunter yeah. cards in line uh, over the course yeah. of uh, the entire expansion or so. Um, but, you know, Demon Hunter's in a really good spot. Still really powerful. Still has a lot of great tools. It's just funny to me to see some of these old cards get splashed in where it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about how good Metamorphosis could be or uh, how how sick, you know, Altruist can be with the right cards and a good amount of tempo on your side. Yeah, sometimes you just need a little bit of a refresher. And Altruist, despite uh, the nerf to the card quite some time ago. Now gets to see the light of day again. Uh, did we, uh, but it will be the Soul Demon Hunter Mirror, and these players are running card for card exactly the same lists. So we do have ourselves a true mirror matchup. And the Soul Demon Hunter Mirror is. No, you dare speak to me! Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Dan. It's dumb. <clears throat> Why do you think that? It's just both players <clears throat> essentially ignoring the board and hitting their opponent in the face. Yeah, the way I like to view the Demon Hunter Mirror, I, I get where you're coming from. The way I like to view it is uh, very similar to a Hunter Mirror, where... There's a little bit of formality early on with like who gets the board advantage. And then very quickly, when one player's uh, in the lead, the other player just feels like they're constantly having to play catch up and try to find a way to race without taking too much damage. Um, yeah. And then there's like a tipping point where there's too much damage and it feels like you can never do anything to catch up. With the exception being, because this doesn't exist in 100 matchups, um, that you have lifesteal to actually gain a bunch of big bursts of HP through the Eldraki Warblade. So I, I do think that um, it, it has a little la extra layer where you have to, you know, obviously push out as much damage as you possibly can. Try to be very tempo-minded and push out 
uh, minions at a high clip early on and then transition to damage. But there is a little bit of complication to the amount of damage that, you know, the breakpoints introduce when you start thinking about what they could be doing, especially when Skull of Gul'dan hits the board. You start to realize that uh, a lot of the uh, assumptions of how much damage that you really need ends up changing. Yeah. So there is <clears throat> some small intricacies, but um, a, a lot of the time, you know, that little formality of who's going to take control of the board feels like it just doesn't exist in this matchup uh, because you, a lot of times you, you don't respect the board because you know that at any point you're just going to remove it with Charge Shatter Mystic or Blade Dance. Uh, you know, almost every weapon swing you want to be uh, hitting base uh, and you don't really care if they're sticking one threes or two threes on the board for most of the time like there ETC could have killed the one three but he just he doesn't care <laughs> the, bo the board seems like it just doesn't matter a lot of times in the matchup uh, to a certain extent obviously they're on the game you can't just leave Glavebound adepts up because you feel like it because um, you feel like pushing a little bit of extra damage, damage to base but uh, minions kind of just get incidentally swept up by the normal happenings of the deck. And you'd rather just push the damage because that's what matters most. Right. And I think this is kind of a, a really important moment in the game here for Zelay. To how to utilize the coin. You could use the coin to Mario Slicer and then push 8 damage in 2 turns and then re-equip another one. Yep, can also just play the Mana Feet of Panthara, but is that, you know, too easily swept up by three damage AoE in the form of the Shattered Mystic? Yeah. He, he's got I, six turns of weapon swings, and he's going to need to equip the Aldraki Warblades and swing both times, most likely, uh, if he wants to win the game. Or at least he he has to assume that. So if he just hero powers and plays Mana Feet of Panthera, he, I feel like he's playing way too slow. Um, so he needs to start getting these Marl Slicer swings out, so that way he doesn't feel terrible about equipping Eldraki Warblades and feels like he's missing damage uh, to, to you know try and up things. But um, I grow impatient. ETC has double Eldraki Warblades. He's kind of in a similar boat. Um, I kind of wanted to see him do the exact same thing. Just equip a weapon, twin, twin slice, push face. Twin slice seems a little bit excessive out. to me. Um... I also think that it might even be behoove him to save these weapon charges because your opponent coined at the marrow slicer, so it's indicated that they're taking a very proactive stance to do something because there is value in holding on to the coin in a matchup like this. And so I would have been okay with ETC hero powering and then equipping the Warblade. And then next turn he would have the glade bound adept and swing because the first charge here of the the warblade feels like they're kind of wasted, right? Like when you have twin slices and all these with a different power, the big dramatic hell swing is really important. So I would have liked to have the second charge so that way glade bound adept here you would still have a weapon equipped and you would have had the glade bound adept on the board as well. So I I, I get where ETC's head is at, which is like I have all these weapon swings from the Aldraki warblades. I have two of them. I need to find use of them earlier. This magic might not even last long enough for me to get yeah. all my swings out. But I don't know if I necessarily fully agree with that notion just because you you have a lifesteal weapon that's going to naturally extend the life of the game to get that value. Even with the lifesteal weapon, though, the game ends incredibly quickly. Uh, because true, true. both players are doing similar things. So <clears throat> Okay, um, but... I guess it does get complicated by the fact he doesn't have, like, Soul Fragments in his deck, so that does make a little bit more sense. But he could totally just play it now. But I guess going back to the previous point, which was that, you know, had he had a weapon charge still existing here, um, you know, he has the ability to hold on to that swing and go for a pretty dramatic... Uh, pretty dramatic life difference... Um, for the following turns. Okay. Is he planning on trading with the Lave Benedict here, TJ? That's really good for Zelay. I was kind of anticipating a sh uh, Shard Shatter patient. Mystic. Yeah, Soul Shard Shatter Mystic. 
That's what I was thinking as well. Upstairs! Whoa! Yeah. So, I actually don't mind this. Um, just because uh, there hasn't been anything that Zelaya has done to indicate that he has all Draki Warblades, and if he does, he would have to over-equip the uh, Marl Slicer. So, essentially, okay. ETC's plan here is just to negate all the damage that uh, Zelaya's dealing. Next turn, he's probably going to go, like, Soul Shard Lapidary uh, in either Soul Shear or Hero Power. Um, push the damage and then go Skull of Gul'dan to, f to try and find game ending damage. Right. No, that, that makes sense because by saving Soul Shear and the Charge Sh Shatter Mystic, he actually sets up a board wipe this way. So, yeah, I, I think I can get behind that. I just, I guess I'm really afraid of taking that six damage from the Glaive Bound. Yeah. So maybe I'm being a little bit too uh, overreactive to that. Hmm. <laughs> so if he continues the 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 Aldraki Warblade completely ruins like I think the game plan that ETC wanted to do, which was uh, essentially race this turn. He wanted he wanted to probably just. Hmm. Soul Shear and then uh, Soul Shard Lapidary, and that's it. And just push face and then find game mini damage with Skull of Gul'dan. Um, but got a little ahead of himself. Like, that's the kind of the, the point I was making earlier where minions, a lot of time, don't matter too much in the matchup because they just get swept up. Like, you just. You, you want to get these Shard Shatter Mystics out of your hand. Uh, you want an excuse to use Blade Dances. So you don't really, you, you rarely want to sink weapon swings into minions. But now ETC is uh, in a weird spot where uh, Zelay's just had a more consistent curve and ETC's game plan has come back to bite him. Right. I, I kind of get where ETC's head's at. Um... And I think that it it's kind of like what I was talking about at the very beginning, right? Impatient. Which was the break points of math end up changing dramatically because of lifesteal. And that does throw like a different dimension. You can't just like count your own damage and think that your opponent doesn't have ways to offset that damage. But, you know, to, to also what you said, Zelay hasn't really shown him like reasons yeah. to make ETC believe that he had that lifesteal. Because yeah. of the the way like how aggressive he had been playing, so it, like Zelay kind of showed that he was playing a lot more damage oriented and a little bit less like yo-yoing his life back and forth. Yeah, that, that that's honestly why I said at the beginning of the matchups that I, I I don't like it is because you can't just sit there and count your own damage and expect to win the game, but you also can't really reasonably play around things um, because if you take it too slow. And they end up not having life steal, and you didn't go fast enough. They'll just kill you with damage. So it's like it's it, it's a really weird matchup where you you have to uh, kind of decide which way to play early on, and then stick to it. And maybe it's the wrong way to play. Maybe it's the right way to play. <laughs> you you just describe what a skillful matchup is in Hearthstone, DJ. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, no, I, understanding. But, but no, a, because because it's there's nothing that the, uh, in, from my opinion, there's nothing that a demon hunter will do that'll give you that information, outside of what they keep in the mulligan. Right, right. Because they're but, like, always going to do definitely... the same thing. They're always going to equip weapons. They're always going to hit you in the face. They're always going to essentially ignore your early game minions. And so you just pick one okay. and go for it. And if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, I get. I definitely understand the point you're trying to make, but I also think that um, it's something that's completely okay. The reason why I feel like I can't agree with your sentiment as Zelay should very clearly play play about death and trade on the board because it's not only that five five up is because we actually have matches where you can't play around things like the ridiculousness of what mage can generate. That's like a totally understandable thing where like I can't afford to play around things. 
Demon Hunter doesn't really do that except for Wand Maker. So it's like you're telling me you can't play around cards that you know is going to be in their deck. I I don't buy it. That's what I'm just telling. I, I I don't I don't buy it 100%. I get where you're coming from. I I, I also hate have Mage to disagree Mirror. here. <laughs> sure, and that that I can understand. I just feel like within this matchup there's ranges that you can totally understand. Even with Skull of Goldan, you can totally still like budget out things. Say like, okay, these are like different ranges I have to keep account uh, uh, I have to count for. But that's that's all it is, TJ. I think it's I think it's you accounting for it and understanding the risk involved in it uh, versus playing afraid. I, I do think that, to your point and to your credit, you do want to generally take a very proactive stance in this matchup and uh, more often than not hope your opponent doesn't have ways to, to counter it or, or rebound in life. But I do think that you can play around certain things in this matchup. Yeah, you can. I agree with that. It's certainly interesting for discussion, and I, I, and I think that uh, we're kind of seeing a little bit of that, right? Like, this is one of the longer games we've seen today. And it's supposed to be a faster paced matchup. A lot of matchups have been ending, like, turn six, turn seven. Or they go really deep because your opponent never draws the bomb that you put into their deck. But this is pretty long for a Demon Hunter mirror. A lot of times it ends up being determined way quicker. And now, without that Shattered Mystic staying on the board, EC does not have a kill. It's lined up for next turn. So um. Lane can just play this Mana Path there and set up a two-turn lethal himself. If he draws more damage, but he doesn't. Oh, I guess he does. Chaos Strike is more damage, but that's not the kind of damage he wants right now. He has a good amount of damage in his deck, too. Yeah. Uh, both Twin Slices... Uh, another Chaos Strike. He also has another Aldraki Warblade in his deck with both Soul Shard Lapidaries. Hmm. Whereas ETC is starting to kind of... Uh, I guess he still has damage in his deck. Chaos Strike, one Twin Slice. Okay, there's Soul Prime picked up. You don't pick the walks. Interesting. Whoa, Mana Ooh, Burn. Mana Burn. I mean, you, honestly, you might as well, right? Burn away. Right. Wow. All right. So, five damage on board. So, Lady needs 12. He has three. Uh, he needs Soul Shard Lapidary and Twin Slice. All right. So, Soul Shard Lapidary. Oh, no, because he doesn't have the mana. Right. There's a mana burn. All right. Demon Companion. What if that hits uh, one of the two damage ones, which would be uh, both the seven. Mini Leoc and the Mini Huffer? That'd be seven plus... Nine. Nope, not impatient. quite. Wow. That mana burn ended up being really powerful here. Okay, so Lei can draw cards in Soul Fragment. I think that actually is a legitimate uh, idea at this point. With a... With a <laughs> he has three Soul Fragments left. He really needs to find it. Oh, finds one. Finds one. Needs another one. Does oh, not get slice. It. Taunt? Taunt? Hits finds taunt. It. Okay. I mean, this was very carefully navigated, and as Leia set up well, ETC is so close to lethal, but he doesn't have a way to get past that taunt right now. Yep. That's game. I don't even know if there was a card in his deck that did it. Wait. I grow impatient. I'm trying to find any kind of way to get out of here, and I don't think it is. Concede from ETC, which means that the lay is up two to zero in a very tight back and forth. You tell me that's not exciting, DJ. Oh, I mean, it gets exciting at the end. I never said it wasn't exciting. All right, fair enough. They, I mean, it's it's two players dealing massive amounts of damage to each other, and also healing massive amounts with Aldraki Warblades and Soul Fragments. It gets exciting for the same reason that Bomb Warrior Mirrors get exciting too when you start to get to the bottom of the deck and uh, and uh, bombs start to be drawn. Um, 
Fair enough. Uh, I do feel like that matchup can sometimes be really silly, like the way you describe it, right? Like in almost any game of Hearthstone, it feels like sometimes one deck just clobbers the other and it's not it's not very compelling because it's super one-sided. That does happen from time to time. But I don't feel like, you know, that happens too often uh, until Demon Hunter Mirrors. Um, if you're playing tight, like if you kind of play like, all right, whatever, I'm just going to play my things and go face every single turn maybe clear any minions that I find remotely threatening. I do think that's an easy way for you to set up uh, blowout wins on both sides, right? Where you like you're, you have the goods, calling them out, getting correctly, uh, calling them out correctly, or sometimes just being like wrong on your guesses. But um, I, do, I do appreciate some of the smaller nuances in that matchup. Let's go to game number three. Zalei has the mage versus the demon hunter. Uh, this matchup should definitely go a lot better for ETC, as Demon Hunter does pressure the mage very well. Yeah, this is one of the uh, worst matchups for the mage. I'd say the only uh, worst matchup would probably be like Face Hunter. Um, for kind of similar reasons, the mage does, just doesn't defend itself very well, uh, specifically with damage from hand. Uh, and specific and uh, um, consistent damage from hand, which that's something that both Face Hunter and uh, Soul Demon Hunter have in common. Yeah, they do it in different ways, obviously, but um, you, you do kind of need a pretty fast like tempo start a lot of times and force the Demon Hunter to you know maybe play off curve or play a little bit less efficiently. You don't pick the wall. Try not to let him get a, try not to let him get set up is the big thing. But the difficulty becomes you're spending all this time to try and set up your own game plan, and the demon hunter's just kind of not caring and, and you know hitting you for a lot. And then by the time you actually do get to set up something big, uh, they have blade dance, they have charge header mistake, and they can just push through. The big things to look for are things from the mana cycle, like frost bolts uh, and deep freezes. Uh, things that can uh, cause disruption because one of the things about Soul Demon Hunter is that's pretty linear in in how it wins games. It doesn't often win games by like s sticking a board and then consistently pushing pushing damage with it because it just doesn't have many minions. It relies on on hitting face. So if you can freeze face consistently, like the deep freeze, and then your water elements will survive. Uh, that can help you a lot. Yeah, that's a good point. So but you can't about. rely on that because obviously it's hard to. Nobody's putting deep freeze in their deck. Most people, and Punizado is putting frostbolt in his deck, uh, but most people aren't putting frostbolt in their deck. I would generally recommend against that. <clears throat> I feel like um, I feel like that frostbolt is only if you're trying to play like a specific target strategy, and I don't think that. Excuse me. Even then, it's like super effective yeah. at um, what you're looking for because you stall for one turn and mage isn't necessarily good at saying like okay this one turn if i stall i'm gonna win the game because it's not consistent at putting that strategy together you need frost bolt and then like do you have the ray of frost or frost nova to really back that up and the board presence and having enough damage even from hand sometimes to follow through and the answer is a lot of times yes but you don't always have that so um, I definitely appreciate the idea that Empezado brought to the table because I do think that people should at least try to do more experimentation like that. Yeah. But I'm not sure if it's really effective. No. Get your frost bolts from your mana cycle and like the rest of us. I grow impatient. That's right. Uh, try and think what ETC is thinking about here. Uh, maybe whether or not to attack. Uh, he doesn't have any more weapon swings in his hand. Um, like So, any more weapon charges in his hand. And he does have double blade dance. So, he's kind of incentivized to just to just hold here, I suppose. Alright, so, uh, it's, it's turn 5, and I have a skull in hand. I want to do everything I can to outcast this skull. So, that Shard Shatter Mystic is coming down every time. And if, it, if this Soul Shear also allows me to push 4 damage to the face, 
I'm doing that. So pretty straightforward play for you. Yep, looks pretty good. Still debating if he wants to swing here because he has two blade dances, and I think he doesn't want to be held hostage by the one weapon charge remaining. Yeah. I mean, he's playing Skull next turn. So he's playing Skull next turn, so he's not going to... More than likely. So he's not going to blade dance. And then by that point, he's likely to have picked up another weapon two turns from now. Maybe he's worried about mana expenditure at that point. Maybe he wants to go like Skull into Skull. Um, well, Mana Giant played. Maybe that changes things. Yeah, I feel like you've taken a lot of damage. Um, grow impatient. And taking eight more is just too much. You go down to 11 life. I guess you're okay with that, though, because yep. you have lifesteal in your soul deck. Fragments. And the punish for not killing this man giant is it ranges from bad to patient. severe. Yeah. I like the pun I don't know. Like if your opponent freezes you, freezes your minion, or clears it off, or plays mirror images and it just hits you in the face, that's bad. They play conjurer's calling and summon like really big powerful stuff, that's that's even worse. And then, like, the ultimate punish, which is just, like, playing a bunch of spells and killing you next turn, which is just really severe, but uh, yeah. unlikely. Yeah. The, with the double blade dance, though, like, um, or even just having one blade dance and a guaranteed Marl Slicer next turn, if he conjures calling, you're, you're even oh. just in hand with Soul Shard Lapidary blade dance is kind of enough, but oh my gosh. Frostbolt. Yeah, Frostbolt does mean that Zlay could play it this turn, could also capitalize on other things like his... Actually, not that much. It's not enough for a Pectus Blast, so I guess it's just a cramp session at that point. But he is setting up a two-turn lethal that way. I mean, he wants to save the Frostbolt for, like, potential Draki Warblades. Right, stop the life steal. Yeah. Soul Shard Lapidary, Blade Dance. Such a beautiful shield. Looks good to me. Yep. Big punches coming out here for ETC. All right. Somehow we've gotten to the point where this looks like both players are racing, even though uh, normally Mage, when they lose their mana giant, they're not in a position to. But because we have a Pexas Blast and Frostbolt, totally could do that. Um, yeah. It's just tough because you have to time this Frostbolt perfectly. <laughs> and if at any point... Aldraki Warblades comes out, it completely ruins your burst opportunity because the deck just doesn't run any burst. So if your plan is just to kind of whittle them down and burst them out with two spells, hmm. like do you preemptively Frostbolt to set up a, a lethal so they can't heal with Aldraki Warblades? Do you try and guess to think when they're going to play it? And there's just soul fragments, right? You'd see a 17 cards left with three soul fragments in the deck. A simple so one of those can you know completely negate uh, some of the things he's trying to do. Burn from Tome of Intellect. Ah, uh, primordial studies. I mean, that can find cheap spell damage, which could effectively turn into burn. Uh, how much damage? Four from the twin slice, three from the cane, two from the position on board with the hero power and the the swordsmith. Uh, nine. Unless Wandmaker gives him exactly twin slice, I don't think it uh, is lethal. Yeah. And even then, second slice would cost one. Oh, right. So I'm, I'm assuming each slice is zero oh. mana, which is not the case. Eldraki Warblades off the top. And Gleefbound Adept. <laughs> right. Well, the Gleefbound Adept is huge. 
Because then he can start counter pressuring. Can even throw in the twin slice here. Yeah. So Shattered Mystic, then Twin Slice, then Glaive and Death. That looks really nasty. I guess he doesn't really need to worry about too much, like unless Blake has just like the ultimate series of burn cards. I kind of wanted to cash in on it though because of for like Frostbolt, Deep Freeze, and like random stuff like that. Because, right. um. Then it's a pretty easy, like, I guess it's not easy. No, it is easy. No, it's not. I was going to say Altruist plus Second Slice plus Kane, but that doesn't account for the card that's actually going to be drawn off the top. But it would give him, like, Altruist plus anything plus Kane, right? If he picks up any one man thing off the top. He might have... So he has one damage to Blade Dance, two damage to One Maker, three, four damage to the Twin Slices. He, he doesn't have enough to kill what him with just do? Altruis. What to do? Right. Runs out on yeah, I guess not. Frostbolt comes out. Wait. Good. I don't know if he can straight up lose the game, but it might be difficult. Counterspell up, so he has to be wary of that. Um, yeah, that would have been lethal. <laughs> I mean, unless the secret was... Like Ice Barrier or Vaporize. If he had played the Twin Slice last mm -hmm. turn, that, this would it would have right. been a lethal setup. I, um, I I'm I I think I would have ripped that twin slice almost every time, but I do I think he was trying to go for the altruist greed. <laughs> Philosophy, cool. Uh, I mean, it's more altruist things, right? Because it copies the spirit trailer. <laughs> and, and this, sure. Well, he has to test for counter spell, and that has to be done by twin slice, right? Uh, philosophy, philosophy does that similarly. Okay, now you just go twin slice, second slice, plate. No, he can't do that because he's spent the time. Uh, you can do twin slice, second slice, spirit jailer. Or you can just say, forget it, just play blade dance right here. And then you have the cane plus hero power next turn. Yeah. Alright. If wait a second, Dan. All Potential five arcade here. missiles go face wait, wait, with the wait, lab wait. partner. Anapex is no, blast. Uh, there's also the possibility that devolving missiles ends up being like something that's crazy good for delay, or also he actually only needs three bad. missiles to go face, right? One. Two. Oh, he's one damage off. If it, if three missiles went face, he had it because a Pexus blast is seven damage plus the ping. Was it proper to devolving missiles first? Uh, I think so. Hmm. I don't Just because know. It that... could... Yeah, it is, because you, if, if the Wand Maker goes down to one health, it does increase the odds that another missile goes face, because one can kill it, and then it's a one and three instead of a one and four to go face. Yeah. ETC is are. big chill. He's just having a snack. <laughs> Munching. Crunching. Winning. So that's going to be game number three. And uh, the Demon Hunter gets there over the Mage. The Mage almost found a way. Uh, so it was one damage off, right? So was there any point which he could have squeezed out an extra point of damage or so? Possibly. It's actually kind of likely because the Mage has so many different play patterns you can go. But did he, like, you know, instead choose a uh, just a generally good approach and then as a result was not aggressive enough or did he just generally do the, the higher percentage play and it turns out if he played a little bit riskier he would have won. Um, 
nothing really leaps out to mind immediately. It did feel like he was a little bit hesitant to commit to things like Sorcerer's Apprentice in the mid stage of the game, yeah. but I don't think it would have changed anything. Um, yeah. And I also think that his choices off of uh, all those card generations seem to be generally correct. So I don't, I, I, I can't really put too much fault onto Zelay right now. I, I, I think I generally align with a lot of the choices that he made. Yeah, and I also feel like ETC should have played a little bit more aggressive and killed Insulay faster, so. Right. I, I don't think he should have even been given enough time to have those like tight spots at the end where he's one damage off, you know? Um, but we'll see if uh, Zelay can do it against the Survival Druid uh, from ETC. Double Mount Cellar, yeah. double Overflow, one Survival. Um, I, I feel like with the double broomstick, this has become relatively standard. There's a lot of different inclusions that you can make. Like we talked about Soleil, uh having the double Anubisat defender and no crystal powers, whereas ETC has the double crystal power, double Tracking broomstick. A lot of different variations you can have with uh, the beast package, whether or not you play all six or five and which five you play. Uh, but we'll see. Oh my goodness, Sources Apprentice, Shinvala. Ugh. <sighs> That's a hand right there. Uh, it just needs... I don't even know what that hand needs. That might be good um, enough as is. I, maybe lab it. partner on one? Lab partner yeah, on lab one. partner on one. That's what it needed. Is that a lab partner? It's a lab partner. Oh, it says explode. Dan, he's TJ. done it. Yeah. He looks like he's cooking. By golly, he's done it. I'm trying to think of if ETC has another god draw. Could he do it as well? I mean, it doesn't seem like Zelay has the spells to really capitalize on Chenvala right now. It's just that he could. That's what the cramp session's for, though. Right. But it doesn't, like, convert to Chenvala procs easily. Yeah. That's uh, true. It's a good hand, but it's not... A god hand. Is it cold like evocation, or is it just me? I think, would probably just put it over the top here. Cause you could yeah. play Sorcerer's Apprentice Evocation next turn. Woo okay, here we go. Some fireworks time. Oh, man. All right, so Sorcerer's Apprentice, that's first. You also have to think about Lake Thresher positioning. You're going into into seven. You're expecting guardian right. animals. ETC plays double leg thresher. Oh, it says yes. So you generally put, put some space your in between units. your ball and your sorcerer apprentice. That's I like that. Yeah. Very much so. You basically space out your threats on the corners, yeah. on the edges, so that way. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. So now Zelay has the option of using Ray of Frost on his own minions in order to summon additional 5-5s. Five fives. That doesn't sound worth it to me. Yeah, because he needs to freeze three things. I mean, maybe. It's just he's freezing five damage in order to summon five more damage. I mean, obviously it doesn't... Translate one to one, but um, okay. Well, this definitely looks good as an option for ETC to take out the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, it does look a little dicey with the Chenvala, though, because he can't kill Chenvala this turn unless he wants to invest a lot of attacks into doing nothing. The lack of Iron Bark here is uh, pretty hard here for ETC. But I think if we can calm down and evaluate the situation a little bit, uh, understand that Mage still has to have the, the spells in order to convert off the Chenvala. So I think prioritizing removing the guaranteed Sorcerer's Apprentice, it seems like a better call here. Yeah, I like this. Yep. Solid. And there's second source apprentice, but 
only a ray of frost in hand, and that's that's a the twin spelled version of it. So only a single spell. Now obviously, you can go Sorcerer Apprentice and then Wand Thieves. You can try and pick up something cheap, but Wand Thieves not guaranteed to give you something cheap. Wow. Whoa. All right. Not guaranteed <laughs> to give you something cheap, but when it gives you a All ray right. of frost, you'll take it. <laughs> That's sick. And now gets to summon a 5-5 five five and reload here with Mana Cyclone. That is insane. Yeah, looks good to me. It's like in... Pay out this board. Finds Mozaki as an option here. Mozaki actually started. Ooh, he ends up picking the uh, hero power buff instead. Mozaki ended up being in a couple of lists I saw on ladder where uh, players were just using it to supercharge versus, you know, decks that can't immediately answer it. And it ended up beating me when I was playing. Um, I, I think I was like testing Muzzy's uh, greedy version of Survival Druid. And I just couldn't answer the 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 Mazaki because I cut like a broomstick from the deck and it ended up just like destroying me single handedly. Like I think in one arcade missiles it eventually did twelve to me. And he like pinged his own vibe spelling and then killed it. And it kinda reminded me like, wow, is this just turning into a combo deck? And I looked back at the replay and I realized that Mazaki was just in the deck list. It wasn't a generated card, and I was like, hmm. What I wonder if that's a like a legit tech card that might even be better than Archmage Antonitis, because I know people are yeah. looking at that as some top in tech, and I want to I want to encourage people to explore Mazaki a little bit. I think that might have actual legs. I mean, that was the deck at the beginning, right? <laughs> uh, right. Well, and so we call him first circle. <laughs> yeah. Point. ETC here. I think it's got to be like Twilight Runner, and then Speaker Gidra kill the Sorcerer Prize. Um, I don't think you can afford to leave the Sorcerer Apprentice up. Actually, you know what? With this much, with full board space, I guess it doesn't really matter. It's just, I mean, evoca if evocation were to come down, you, you, it's possible you just die. I mean, I, I think ETC's chances of winning this game are so low. Twilight Runner needed to come down that turn. And then Speaker Gidra taking three power off the board and potentially, like, uh, interrupting Zelay's, uh plan of uh, getting some additional cheap spells. Um... Is that worth more than having access to one additional mana next turn? Hard to say. Maybe Speaker Gidra with a big spell next turn is the way that ETC comes back. Maybe he's expecting, all right, what what gets me back into this game? An overflow draw. Okay, well, how do I capitalize an overflow draw? I draw cheap removal plus my Speaker Gidra's huge. Um, maybe that's how, uh, that's his, his uh, mindset in this one. But Zelay has 12, 13, 14, 15, 18 damage on board. Can't find lethal, but I mean, he's gonna get close. He's got a wand deep in hand. You push three, put him down to six. Fireball from a wand thief is all of a sudden out, or anything sticking. Okay. Uh. Wait. Whoa, let's not rush here. Yeah, I don't well, know. Let's rush a little bit with the broomstick, but not. I'm not sure if the Yasera unleashed is what we need here. I'm thinking Twilight Runner. I'm thinking I we uh, the portals is I, I don't think it's likely enough. I think we draw first with Twilight Runner and then see. Okay. Didn't find anything. All right. <laughs> now we got to go again. Um. Overflow there would have been the juice. Like let's say he is Sarah's and then draws and he doesn't hit any portals. That's his whole turn. Right, that was what I was afraid of, that Ysera yeah. would beat nothing. Twilight Runner does at least feel like it gives him... Well, those draws don't exactly help enough. Uh, I mean, he could pick up, like, Crystal Power, Bog Team, Nature Studies. There's things that can help. Innervate doesn't help. Iron Bark. He's... Yeah, Gidra needs to Speaker free. Gidra, Iron Bark, Double Innervate, Hero Power. He's alive at one. Whew. And we
we know that uh, Zalei has, I think, Guarantee Lethal with the Violet Spellwing. No. No, it's actually not guaranteed, but... Wand Thief? Wand, Wand Thief maker. also could be likely. I think Wand Thief's a little bit better. Yep. Uh... Wand Maker, Magic Trick, Frostbolt. You don't pick the wand. Yeah, Wand Maker here is fine. Brain Fees works nicely. You can just uh, clear the board. He, <laughs> had he played Bra uh had he had an additional mana, he would have actually guaranteed it now because he could have Brain Freeze the minion, then pinged his own minion, uh, pinged his own spell wing, and then played the Arcane Missiles. But I don't think it's a big deal. Oh, Soleil seems to be in such a dominant position that I don't really foresee DC being able to climb back, even if Soleil um, mm -hmm. lets him lose another turn here. All right, this is the final push. Slay looks like he is 99.9% .9 to win right now. I don't know what he could have done. Although, having seen the way this panned out, maybe the Astera line actually would have worked out or given him a, a chance. Because he did end up picking up other forms of card draw. Ah, uh, you Lightning Bloom. You have to Lightning Bloom first. What? I, I don't really know if anything would have changed. So that's going to do it. Zalay wins 3-1. to one And improves his score here in the round robin. EC takes his first loss in Stage 2 of Grandmasters this season. But hey, you know, uh, still a pretty good solid uh, first three games. Go 2-1. and one. Yeah. And it seemed like uh, overall... Uh, you know, I, I liked where ETC's play was uh, today. You know, there was moments last week and even in the other uh, times that we've seen ETC where it looked a little bit shakier. But it seemed like today he really kind of had, um, you know, his head focused and it was definitely having less of those moments where it felt like ETC was kind of falling apart at tough turns. And overall, like, you know, you got to you gotta feel like today was a really fun set of games. Yeah, it's kind of funny that uh, I, I, I felt uh, similarly and... Those were in the series that ETC won.